seminar series. I'm Robbie Richardson, the Associate Director of the Institute here at Portland State University. Glad to see you all. Before I introduce the speaker, I just want to remind you of a couple of uh, housekeeping issues. If you could please turn off your cell phones, <coughs> that would be most appreciated. And also, we are uh, streaming on a live webinar tonight and also archiving this for uh, video uh, recording. So at the time uh, for questions and discussions, we will ask you to please use this floor microphone here in the center rather than shouting from your chairs so that the uh, audience on the web can hear your questions. We are very fortunate this evening to have uh, Professor John Loomis visiting us uh, from Colorado. Uh, Dr. Loomis is Professor of Agricultural and Resource Economics at Colorado State University where he has uh, spent the bulk of his career bringing economic perspectives to public lands management, um, environmental policy issues such as endangered species and water quality, and a range of other uh, environmental uh, economics problems and solutions that, uh, that you'll get the chance to learn a little bit more about tonight. Uh, prior to his position at Colorado State, uh, John held a faculty position at University of California at Davis and he also has held uh, positions with federal agencies, including the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Bureau of Land Management. Tonight, uh, Dr. Loomis is going to talk with us about a subject uh, called co collaborative conservation, particularly in the context of endangered species uh, recovery. And this particular project he's speaking with us about tonight is uh, related to endangered uh, fish recovery in uh, the upper Colorado River Basin. So please join me in welcoming Dr. John Loomis to us this evening. Well, thank you very much. I want to uh, thank my host, uh, Dr. Richardson, for in inviting me out. And uh, it's nice to see some familiar faces. We come out and do some uh, workshops periodically here uh, with the uh, Hatfield School of Government. So it's always uh, kind of fun to come here. This study was funded by um, the state of Colorado, its Con Water Conservation Board, because uh, they were interested in this question about how well the collaboration, and so was I, because I did most of my work, you'll see some of it on non-market valuation uh, and benefit-cost analysis, but we were wondering, okay, well, how, how well does collaboration work? Uh, can it realize its uh, potential? So I want to start a little bit, you know, take a step back and say, well, how do humans cooperate, right? So, well, with private goods, right, one of the ways we, you know, kind of cooperate is, at least in this country, is, is generally through markets if it's private goods, right? So, you know, there's lots of ways we can allocate scarce resources. Markets uh, is one of them, you know, it's voluntary. Uh, it's beneficial to, you know, usually both parties. And, you know, that contrasts with a regulatory environment, right? Endangered Species Act is notorious for being this inflexible, uh, regulatory, mandatory environment. And so we want to say, well, how might people cooperate uh, on endangered species, per particularly public goods, right? I mean, many of the cases, we have public goods, and we've chosen as a society not to allocate them through markets you know, purposely. We don't buy and sell whooping cranes, uh, you know, uh, spotted owls and so forth. I mean, society says, uh-uh, any more than we buy and sell kids. You know, eBay is not allowed to, you know, right? Somebody tried to sell their liver or kidneys or something, right? So, um, and in some cases, even if we had a market for these things, it would be subject to what we call market failure. The market doesn't work well for these. So what are, you know, some examples of these public goods? Well, you know, clean air and clean water are classic, but endangered species are uh, as well. And, you know, we look, okay, what are the benefits of protecting endangered species? Well, one is that people would pay just to know the species exist. So how much would you pay for protection? Also, if we protect it today, it's available for future generations. So everybody, you know, if I protect the uh, spotted owl or if I protect the riverside fairy shrimp, you know, that species is available. And because everybody can get these benefits, you know, they're, they're non-excludable, right? I can think about the, 
you know, if you think of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, I can think about, wow, neat it would be to, you know, the porcupine caribou herd migrating out to the coastal plain, and you can think of it. And you don't use it up, right? So it's non-rival and it's non-excludable in the sense that, you know, if I can't, and that's why the market doesn't work, right? Because in fact, you can't exclude somebody if, if they don't pay. The other thing is that the market doesn't work because when we have increasing scarcity of endangered species, uh, it doesn't bring about a market response, right? So if we have, you know, higher prices of gasoline, you know, scarcity of gas, higher price, people can serve more supply. We got down to 12 condors. As far as I can tell, the price of condors did not go up. <laughs> L.L. Bean did not start offering condors, you know, in their catalog, right? Um, so we, we have to cooperate um, outside of the market here. And people look at this and say, okay, well, how might we um, cooperate on public goods? And basically, stakeholder collaboration has been one way uh, that people say, okay, well, look, this would be a way to collaborate and it's an alternative, right, to the sort of adversarial kind of approach where I'll see you in court, right, and my lawyer will, you know, try and beat up on your lawyer. Uh, so the idea is, look, let's not sue, let's work together to find some on-the-ground solutions. So let's set aside our ideologies and say, okay, look, are there some practical things that we can agree on in, in this case? We're going to pool our, our money and skills. Environmental groups sometimes have, you know, biologists. Um, and so instead of having the Fish and Wildlife Service biologists testifying against, you know, the uh, defenders of wildlife biologists, why don't we have the biologists, you know, kind of working together? And the other thing is they can seek funding uh, for habitat recovery. And sometimes the stakeholder groups can be successful, as you'll see in the case study. Now, one of the things we worry about, particularly as, as economists, is who's represented around the table in these stakeholder collaborations. Um, you know, example, some of you might have heard of you know, the Quincy Library Group in Quincy, uh, Northern California, and all the environmental groups, the logging groups, the timber groups, you know, got together with the homeowners and said, look, you know, this war in the woods has got to stop. Our mill doesn't have enough timber. We've got fire danger. So they agreed to meet in the Quincy Library and they worked through and developed an alternative forest plan that the Congress funded and approved and that the Forest Service implemented. But it's called the Quincy Library Group, right? <laughs> There's a lot of users of the National Forest that are in San Francisco <laughs> that can't be running to the Quincy Library to attend these meetings, uh, for example. And sometimes we worry that, in fact, this collaboration, well, let's push the people that are at the table, will push costs off on the taxpayers and other people. So that's what we wanted to investigate here, is, okay, was collaboration successful? Uh, and, in fact, um, you know, how much of the cost, if any, got pushed onto the taxpayers, and was there cost savings? So the, the particular avenue or venue to kind of look at this issue of collaboration was this Upper Colorado River um, Endangered Species Recovery Program. And we're going to answer these questions in terms of, oops, wrong button. We're going to answer the questions in terms of, okay, was the collaboration successful? Well, by successful, we mean did it keep, you know, these folks from suing each other over 20 years? Uh, did it aid species recovery, and did it save money? So in some sense, you know, there's, there's a couple elements here of, you know, process. Is the process successful? Is the outcome successful as well? The process might work, but you may not get much in the way of results. So people don't sue each other, and they all sit around and sing kumbaya, but, you know, the species is still going belly up. So we want to look at, look at these. Now, the methods we used to do this study is we reviewed all the agency documents, all the memorandums and uh, memorandums of agreement and understanding, and then we conducted interviews. We conducted interviews with all the stakeholders 
and uh, you know, spend several hours with all these busy folks uh, from you know, Grand Junction and Denver and uh, elsewhere. And you know, that was sort of the raw data then that went into this analysis. So these are the three of the four species of interest, and they're all listed under the Endangered Species Act, and they're all uh, listed as endangered. And our study area uh, focuses on, you know, the stretch here, the, you know, this is considered the upper Colorado River. Uh, believe it or not, you know, Denver is one of those stakeholders, the Denver water, because uh, much like California, you know, we let people move where they want and hell will bring the water to them. <laughs> and so, you know, that's what they do in California, that's what we do in Colorado. Uh, so there's a lot of trans mountain uh, diversions that bring water from the Colorado to the Front Range. Uh, in addition, you know, the key critical habitat, so one of the features of the Endangered Species Act is designation of critical habitat. So a lot of these areas are critical habitat. Here's Grand Junction. Uh, one of my favorite ski areas is there, Aspen. And then here's Moab, which some of you may have heard of. So that kind of locates the study area. Here's a list of some of the stakeholders, and I'm going to keep adding to this list. So one of the things that ESA is known to do, right, is it's at loggerheads with lots of other laws. So in this case, we have state water rights, state prior appropriation doctrines that says states have the right to appropriate water uh, within their states to beneficial use. We also have the Colorado River Compact between the upper basin and lower basin states. Now we've got the Endangered Species Act on top of that. And so those laws oftentimes are in conflict with one another. And so some of the stakeholders then, the state of Colorado, the state of Wyoming are involved because in fact under state water rights, they make the determination of who uh, may put water to beneficial use, which while in-stream flows is one of those, it's usually diversion. Then you've got the federal agencies. A lot of these are Bureau of Reclamation projects, uh, Bureau of Reclamation reservoirs. The Fish and Wildlife Service, as many of you know, are the, is the agency responsible for implementing the Endangered Species Act. So they're clearly at the table. And part of this collaborative approach is they're joined by others at the table rather than it just being the Fish and Wildlife Service doing battle with all the other uh, stakeholders. Western Area Power Authority and, and uh, Colorado River Energy because of the hydropower involved. So you've got federal agencies. And then you've got the water users. So you've got the, you know, they've got funny names. The Colorado Water Congress is one of these euphemisms, you know, like who in the hell are these people, right? <laughs> um, but that's their, you know, organization. Utah Water Users, Western Resource Advocates, Wyoming Water Association. So you've got the irrigators. I mean, in the West, right, 90% of the water goes to irrigated agriculture. So the irrigators are a big user. Uh, but as I mentioned, a lot of that water goes to Denver for municipal uses as well, uh, cooling and power plants. And then here you got this sort of lone environmental group, you know, the Nature Conservancy. And, you know, this is right away one of the issues with collaboration. Okay, who can afford to sit at these meetings and collaborate, right? I mean, some of these groups get paid to do that. <laughs> and, you know, it it's a, can be an issue of deep pockets. But it has been successful. For 20 years, it's been a, almost a path-breaking group. And in fact, I'll, we'll pause a moment and let you read what Ken Salazar, the Secretary of Interior, had to say. So he obviously thinks, and, and he's not alone. I mean, there's been, you know, the prior Secretary of Interiors. You know, anything that can keep these people out of court, <laughs> right? The, they're at least say the process is working. Now, beyond the process, you know, we go, well, how is success measured? Um, no one sues. Okay, that's part of it. The good news is, is there's not delays while it's hung up in court, 
right? I mean, in many cases, the species continues to deteriorate while these court suits drag on and appeals drag on. Uh, look at the wolf recovery program on the delisting of the wolves, for example. I mean, that's gone on now for a few years. Uh, one of the things is, it can it save money, right? I mean, the, the thing is, is that not only is it, are these, you know, going to court unproductive, but the, it's going to see Fish and Wildlife Service consulting on a project by project by project basis on a thousand projects. Uh, may not be the most efficient way uh, and the most productive way to enforce the Endangered Species Act. Uh, and then, oops. You know, one of the things is, in fact, you know, this is outcome success, right? Okay, nobody sues, uh, it saves money, but does the species benefit, right? Which is the ultimate goal of the Endangered Species Act uh, is recovery. And, and that's one of the issues here that the state of Colorado was interested in is can a collaborative process be more than a holding pattern for these species, right? Having a species that continues to be uh, on the endangered species list, uh, you know, can hamstring uh, a lot of the water uh, agencies and, and make life difficult and more expensive. The goal of the Endangered Species Act is recovery, and in this case, downlisting from in, uh, endangered to threatened, and in addition, to eventually recover the species. So the wolf is a nice case of a you know, successful case where they reintroduced it, this population's met the recovery target, and now it's being taken off the endangered uh, species list. So that's the goal here uh, as well. So in, we're gonna kinda go through the five um, elements of the recovery program and contrast this with what the Fish and Wildlife Service business as usual. So that's our baseline or reference case is, okay, how would the Fish and Wildlife Service and the water users interface in a business as usual from, versus a collaborative stakeholder approach? So one of the elements here, um, of this, and I'll maybe just put all of, them, all of them up. You know, there's a research and monitoring program. There's uh, endangered fish propagation and stocking. And habitat management, and, and basically in-stream flows was the only lever that Fish and Wildlife Service had under the Endangered Species Act. That was the only requirement. And we'll look at some of that in terms of uh, water di diverters having to replace, right? The mitigation for diverting is, okay, you gotta maintain those in-stream flows. But that's only one part of protecting the habitat, right? Species need more, I mean, Fish need water, you know, that's a Homer Simpson, duh. <laughs> but, you know, they also need other habitat components, right? And so, you know, one of the elements is actually developing the backwaters, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, in addition, there's a lot of, you know, these diversion structures suck in a lot of fish, right? That's been an issue in California, I know, with the irrigation ditches. Um, you know, they'll suck a lot of the baby, you know, the fries and the smolts in and off into the irrigation canal, right? So can we fix that problem? And then um, the same way with non-native fish, you know, this has been a big deal in the Grand Canyon with the humpback chub. You know, apparently those humpback chub fry are real tasty to rainbow trout. And we've introduced a lot of trout in the Colorado River system. And in fact, now, you know, they're one of the major invasive species, right, is one of the major threats to many native endangered species. So again, this is another element uh, of this broad recovery program, which is broader than just, okay, um, you have to replace flows. So is the recovery occurring in terms of pro, um, outcome success? You know, yes, it's reversed the decline. And so, you know, for endangered species, and especially long-lived species like the humpback chub, you know, that's, that's pretty successful uh, right there. And, you know, from documents that the Fish and Wildlife Service has put forward and this recovery program has put forward, you know, it looks like they're moving to what they call downlisting from endangered to threatened. And that again um, uh, reduces that straitjacket because with threatened species, you're allowed to have incidental take, whereas with an endangered species, you're really not allowed to have even incidental take. Um, and then their goal, you know, they seem to be on track for actual full recovery and removal from the list. 
So, you know, one of the things that we heard consistently from the agencies and from the stakeholders is, you know, this program is doing more than just a holding pattern, you know, sort of keeping them in the uh, emergency room and intensive care, but is actually, you know, moving toward the goal of the Endangered Species Act, which is recovery. Well, what are these fish worth? I, you know, some of you know I do this contingent valuation and I couldn't resist doing a, you know, have an audience and a slideshow and could have to talk a little bit about what's the benefits of endangered species. Because what we're gonna do is sort of a simple benefit cost analysis. And so there's cost savings that are benefits, but the species is another benefit. So there's been a couple of these willingness to pay surveys we've been involved in um, it's a survey of households. It's not a public opinion poll. You know, it's what people would pay, for example, into a trust fund to either maintain the species or increase it. And we were involved in a study with the Bureau of Reclamation on, you know, protecting all the endangered species, all uh, nine of them uh, threaten endangered fish in the entire Colorado and Green River system. But that's a little too broad, right? We're looking at a small stretch of critical habitat for just four of these species. So the, what we've got is an approach called benefit transfer. So there's been lots of studies on these in, uh, in threatened endangered fish, for example, threatened endangered species. And uh, my uh, student for her master's thesis, we updated this meta-analysis and it gives us an equation, a regression equation that we can then, you know, insert, um, you know, set the values, okay, it's a, it's a fish and, you know, it's an annual willingness to pay. And most importantly is we can do incremental analysis. So it's not all or nothing. I mean, that's one of the nice things, you know, people have made advancements in contingent valuation. It's just not, well, what are you willing to pay to keep it from going extinct, right? I mean, that's not really, policy relevant on the Endangered Species Act, that's not allowed. It's additional recovery toward um, the listing. So this worked out, you know, we look and say, okay, look, even if, even if this uh, recovery program and the population estimates, as many of you that are fisheries biologists or ecologists know, are very difficult to make. Uh, even if it makes just a 10% increase over the, you know, basic Fish and Wildlife Service business as usual approach. Um, you know, that's a gain of about $17 per household. You know, this is a public good. Remember we talked about these, uh, protecting and increasing these species as a public good in terms of existence values, knowing uh, there's a larger population, knowing that future generations will have a more viable population. So, you know, times the number of households gives us a benefit of about, um, you know, $51 million. So that's sort of a lower bound estimate of, okay, what are the economic benefits of uh, additional recovery of these species through the recovery program? Now, there's also savings with Section 7 consultation. Uh, as many of you know, with Section 7 consultation, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service has to be consulted by whoever's the project proponent is if there's a federal, federal connection. And in the West, public lands, right? I mean, this area, particularly on the Upper Colorado River, has got National Forest, Bureau of Land Management lands. So there is a federal connection. There's Bureau of Reclamation projects. So the agencies or the project water developer has to consult with Fish and Wildlife Service and to determine if it adversely affects the endangered, uh, an endangered species and what can be done to mitigate it. Well, this is just a, a little scan of, you know, this is the Section 7 consultation process, right? <laughs> now, you know, it's not quite a wiring diagram, <laughs> uh, but it's a complicated process. Uh, with many decision points, many areas for, you know, okay, we need more data, right? I mean, there's a joke a little bit about, uh, you know, contrasting a biologist, uh, an engineer, uh, and a lawyer, right? What's two plus two? Well, the engineer, you know, exactly two plus exactly two is exactly four. You know, the lawyer, two plus two, looks around, closes the door. What do you want it to be? <laughs> The biologist, 
you ask them, and you ask them, and there's, you know, crumpling pieces of paper and throwing things away, and finally, what's two plus two? I need more data. <laughs> And that seems to be one of the you know, problems with the ESA is it's hard to make that deter biological determination. Does it adversely affect the species? How much mitigation is required? And of course, there's differences of opinion. So this process is uh, you know, subject to a lot of delay, a lot of data requirements, and we'll talk about how expensive it is in, uh, in one case. So in fact, you know, when we start looking at this Section 7 consultation, just in this upper Colorado River reach, there was an over almost 2,000 of these consultations. Because every time somebody wants to divert water, whether it's for a homeowner's association, you know, it's pond, a stock pond, uh, for golf courses, for subdivisions, ranchettes, I mean, no matter how small it is, if it's in that critical habitat, they have to consult with Fish and Wildlife Service. Well, I mean, the agency doesn't, I mean, they've only got two or three people over there in Grand Junction on the West Slope. There's no way in the world they can go through, you know, that many, um, you know, Section 7 consultations when you consider that, you know, the process is, is fairly involved with many decision points. And this is a costly, process for, you know, the water developers as well. Um, this was a rather large water diversion. This was one of our case studies. Um, the Ute Water District, which is over in the Grand Junction area, wanted to divert about 20, 28,600 acre feet uh, of water. And initially, the Fish and Wildlife Service said under Section 7, well, you'll have to replace, you know, 19,000 acre feet. Well, that makes it, you know, <laughs> expensive. You're only getting, you know, from a beneficial use standpoint, um, you know, 28,000 and you're giving up. You have to develop and pay for another 19,000 uh, acre feet of water. And basically, you know, the agency said, okay, look, you know, it's cheaper to hire hydrologists and engineers than it is to come up with 19,000 <laughs> acre feet of water. So the... The Ute Water District hired, you know, and there's a, some nice articles on all the hydrologic modeling that had to take place, uh, endangered fish modeling, and they were able to whittle that down from 19,000 acre feet to 11,000 acre feet of replacement. But that process of meeting and modeling and more requests for data, you know, that took four years and cost them almost two and a half million dollars. And that was just the cost to the Ute Water District. It didn't include, you know, all the state and federal agencies, you know, Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Reclamation, the Bureau of Land Management, whose land this pipeline crossed, and, and all the meetings. So with the recovery program, they were able to streamline this Section 7 uh, consultation. You know, essentially, the, the collaborative recovery program acted as what they sometimes call a reasonable and prudent alternative. So it was a biological opinion that was programmatic. It was an umbrella that covered, you know, a whole host of water diversions and said, okay, look, if you've got really small, you know, if you're diverting less than 100 acre feet, like you've got a ranch yet or you're a rancher and you want another, you know, a stock pond out there, Look, if it's between zero and 100 acre feet, look, this is just gonna be almost pro forma. You're gonna tell us what you're gonna do, where the point of diversion is, and how much is being diverted so we have a record of it. And we'll make sure there's nothing unusual uh, about it. And then you won't even, in this case, for these small type of diversions, you won't even have to pay what's called a depletion fee that goes in to help fund the recovery program. Now, if, if you're going to divert a significant amount of water, you know, then, of course, it's a more elaborate Section 7 consultation process. But it's still a lot less involved. It's streamlined. Uh, and you pay $17 an acre foot for all the water you divert. And you don't have to replace your water diversions then. Uh, your obligation under the Endangered Species Act then is, is finished. And so this is a little bit like what... Um, Interior Secretary Babbitt had for a while this sort of no surprises policy. You know, here's 
you know, you're, you've met your obligation under the law, and that money then goes into this fund to help fund the recovery program, like habitat, in, uh, invasive species, uh, re, uh, elimination, and so forth. And then if you've got a really big, and this was like the Ute Water Project, a really large uh, diversion that you're proposing, um, you know, it's gonna be more involved, but you know, it shouldn't take more than a year to do this. I mean, they told us now, if that project was to go forward now under this recovery program, that it would take, you know, somewhere between a few months to, you know, at most a year to do this. Um, and they too would pay this 17 acre foot um, depletion fee. And again, that would be the end of their obligation. So, you know, that recovery plan really, you know, does a good job and each and every diverter does not have to file a separate recovery plan, right? I mean, that was part of the thing with these 1,700 recovery plans. Each and every diverter would have to, you know, basically develop a recovery plan, Fish and Wildlife Service review it and approve it. So for the Ute Water District, that large uh, project, you know, basically in talking to them, they're saying, yeah, now if we were to go through this process now, it would only take a year at most, right? Uh, no more than 300 days. So it would take, you know, a year or less, and that saves three years, you know, of us, uh, you know, planning and so forth, and delay in our projects, right? I mean, the West Slope during some of this period of time was having a significant amount of growth, both, you know, retirees, um, and oil and gas development occurring there. And, you know, the, the planning on these projects, you know, three-year delay uh, was significant. In addition, the costs have been reduced from like $2.5 million down to, uh, you know, $250,000. So for, and this is just for each large project, you know, there's these substantial, uh, substantial cost savings. So it does seem to be saving money uh, in that respect, in streamlining things. In addition, there is still, you know, flow requirements. In other words, they've got to keep enough water in the river for the endangered uh, fish. They can't just go, okay, you got carte blanche, go ahead and, you know, divert at will. But there's some economies of scale of looking at this, you know, collaborative group, right? I listed, you know, there are probably about 12 stakeholders. Within each water district, there's, you know, half a dozen to a dozen projects. Some irrigation districts are, um, you know, have large projects, some have small projects. And so the idea is that they could search across their, you know, various projects and say, okay, rather than each irrigator having to develop their own replacement water flows on a very small scale, right? The engineering aspects of this is, look, one large project, or in this case where they expanded this, raised this reservoir up, you get this huge volumetric increase in water at, you know, sort of minimal incremental cost as compared to having, okay, each irrigator is gonna have to, or each irrigation district build their own reservoir or develop their own water source or retire their own land. And the same way with water delivery systems. So again, there's some economies of scale that lower the per unit cost of providing the amount of flow that's necessary. Um, in addition, if you look at this as a system, and again, that's the beauty of this collaborative, you know, stakeholder group. They had everybody in it in the upper Colorado River Basin. So they all sort of work together rather than the usual. I kid, you know, that in a lot of these, uh, who's responsible, you know, this is the sort of uh, kind of not me, he is, she is, right? I mean, in this case, they say, look, we're all in this together. We've got a recovery program that hinges on all of us working together Let's look across all the water districts and see who can do this, right, um, most cheaply. Who's, who's got some opportunities, uh, in many cases, to do this at, at lower cost? And those depletion fees and the money that we're going to get from Congress will fund that, right? One of the complaints about ESA is it's an unfunded mandate or it's the burden is placed on the landowner in many cases that, okay, look, it's a public resource, but you, the private landowner, are responsible. 
Well, I mean, in some sense, you know, if you're creating the problem, the, the negative externality, you should be responsible for paying some of the cost, right? A polluter pay principle. Uh, but on the other hand, as we said, right, there's benefits of these fish to the general public in terms of existence and bequest values. So the collaborative approach says, look, we're all in this together. Um, we'll use our pooled resources and we'll find what you know, water districts might be able to supply that in-stream flow requirement at least cost. And in many cases, some of the irrigation districts have the, you know, sort of flood irrigation, you know, that's really inefficient. And to move water from one end of the field to the other, I mean, they literally have to flood the darn thing. And, you know, it's just not an efficient use of water. You know, in many cases, to get water to the crops, you know, using sprinklers, okay, those cost money. Well, again, this is funded by the recovery program, so the costs aren't uh, solely on the landowner. And hence, the landowner is willing to cooperate. Sure, you know, if, if you want to um, help fund putting, you know, sprinklers on, uh, you know, center pivot irrigation or sprinklers or something like that on there, you know, I'm happy to go along with that. So, you know, we often talk about that in conservation, right? Looking for sort of the low hanging fruit. So what are the cheap ways of meeting? We still have to meet the goal, right? This is cost effectiveness. We're not, and that's a nice thing. If we can do it cost effectively, it takes pressure off the desire to. We gotta amend the Endangered Species Act. We gotta repeal the Endangered Species Act, right? When it gets costly to do this, the political pressure mounts in many cases to, we gotta amend it, we gotta repeal it, we gotta, you know, water it down. You know, the idea here is if we can do this in a collaborative, cost-effective way, then that puts the, you know, spreads the burden around, if you will. So by having, there's a, there's a typo here, that's supposed to be without. So without the collaborative uh, recovery program, those five recovery elements, if Fish and Wildlife Service's business as usual was just in-stream flow, that's the only thing we can request, that's how you diverters are gonna have to, if you will, pay or mitigate, right? Then, you know, a huge amount of water um, would have been required. And we calculated, you know, even an upper bound on the cost of, you know, developing this water because they've got several programs in place. So we were able to go look at their engineering cost estimates. And so it costs about $5,000 to develop an acre foot of water. And that's kind of bounded by the value of water. If anything beyond that, they can start retiring, <laughs> you know, even some of the higher valued land uh, to free up that water. So if the recovery program wasn't in place and all the burden was just recovery via in-stream flows, you know, it would have cost, you know, $863 million. Well, with that five, you know, elements of the recovery program where you've got, you know, the other elements, habitat restoration, you know, non-native fish control and so forth, right? Those are other elements of habitat besides just in-stream flow by spreading out your resources across all the habitat requirements for the fish, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service said, okay, well look, as part of this multi-pronged comprehensive recovery program, oops, you know, we're only gonna require 59,000 acre feet at the same cost, $5,000 an acre foot. Now the costs are 206 million. So there's quite a cost savings that occurs there. And so that's a, a significant benefit, right? We're still benefiting the species. And in fact, we're doing more for the species than just in-stream flow alone would do because it's unlikely that in-stream flow is the only limiting factor uh, for the endangered species habitat. So that's a pretty big ticket item right there. So is collaboration you know, successful? Well, it's certainly a big cost savings uh, in meeting the goals of the Endangered Species Act, which is species recovery, rather than just you know, holding the population, uh, keeping it from going extinct. Now there's cost, um, you know, there's no free lunch. And uh, these groups were able, the recovery partners, right? So I mean, agencies can't lay, uh, lobby Congress for more appropriations. 
but the states of Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, the water users can. And so those folks said, look, we've got this collaborative stakeholder group. We've agreed not to sue each other. We've come up with a recovery plan, but we need some supplemental funding, right? The water users are gonna pay some of this, um, but if we're gonna do this, uh, you know, to do the habitat, build hatcheries, uh, build, you know, restore habitat, uh, take out uh, trout and so forth, it's gonna cost. And so some of this cost, and this is the cost shifting element, right, gets spread from the water users to the taxpayers. So as part of the federal appropriation, this was over 20 years, um, you know, the appropriations to the Bureau of Reclamation from the federal treasury, about $154 million, appropriations to Fish and Wildlife Service, 25. So 85% of the cost is funded by the federal taxpayer. Now, we also have to recognize ESA is a federal law, right? These species are federally listed species. And the benefits, right, I mean, if we think of these, right, endangered species protection is a public good. It's available, and we've done some studies to show that even if you don't live, you know, right near the resource, there's still significant benefits. They may tail off somewhat, but they don't drop to zero once you get out of the Colorado Plateau, for example. Now, the states are also kicking in money. Uh, it's a Colorado taxpayer. I'm paying some of that. Utah taxpayers. Now, the irrigators are picking up in terms um, of some of this cost. But in terms of the actual out-of-pocket cost, the financial cost, they're picking up a pretty small part of the total cost. But if you remember, you know, they are paying, um, you know, the water replacement costs. So when we pull all this together, we're kind of getting down toward the summary here. We've got, you know, the savings on large projects with the Section 7 consultation. We weren't able to quantify um, the small projects, but a couple of the stakeholders said, look, you know, when you've got 1,700 ESA Section 7 consultations, you know, the savings on not having to do 17 hundred individual section seven consultations, you know, is, is probably set several million dollars. The reduced water replacement costs, you know, as we saw on that, you know, if we go back a couple slides, you know, that's where that cost savings comes from. And then we had earlier, you know, talked about uh, the benefits, the existence and bequest values of additional species recovery. So we got some benefits and then we've got some costs, right? The water users are paying about half the cost through their water replacement and depletion fees. And then, you know, the taxpayers, you and I, are paying about half of it. So the, the total cost of this recovery program over 20 years has been about $400 um, million. But you know, the benefits of this, and a big chunk of the benefits, right, are the cost savings, particularly the reduced water replacement cost savings. On net, yeah, the program, in fact, saves society money. So it's not only recovering the species, but it's saving, saving money. So was collaboration successful? Well, yes, it, you know, by process criteria, yeah, no one sued. I mean, it's amazing, right, to be managing an endangered species in conflict with state water laws, um, with that many agencies and interest groups. And over 20 years, when you sign on to that recovery program as a participant and go under that umbrella for endangered species recovery, you agree not to sue, and people have stayed with that. Um, it has appeared to enhance uh, endangered species recovery. You know, there's been a slight increase in population that looks like it'll be able to downlist. And without it, you know, the question is, would they have been able, to, would it be declines or would they just been able to maintain it? It saved money. Uh, you know, some of those costs, right? Half the cost got shifted from the water users, from farmers. Now, municipal water users, right? The city of Denver takes a significant amount of water out of that. Uh, Fort Collins, most of the front range gets a lot of its water. So in one sense, if you pay a water bill, <laughs> right, if it saves Denver water or Fort Collins, you know, municipal water utility money, that is passed on to you as a, a water consumer. 
you know, a lot of the costs are, you know, half the costs are borne by the water users, but a chunk is paid for by the federal taxpayers. Is that a good investment? Another way to look at this with the collaborative stakeholder process. Yes, some of those costs got shifted. Yes, the federal taxpayers, right, ended up having to pay $208 million. Was that a good investment of federal taxpayer money in maintaining this collaborative stakeholder process? Well, you know, the answer is yes, right? It saved, you know, that investment saved $300 million, um, you know, to society as a whole. So from a standpoint of economic efficiency, you know, it does seem to be a successful program. You know, it saves money, recovers the species, keeps this thing out of court, minimizes delays. You know, the only question one might ask, is it, you know, equitable or is it fair, the way those costs are distributed? Well, I've talked plenty long enough. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer questions. Questions for Dr. Loomis, if you'd come up to the microphone. While folks are making their way over, I'll, I'll just add that, you know, this is really um, consistent with a lot of the themes we've explored this term in this seminar series, looking at solutions or better ways of doing things. And I, I really think this is an interesting uh, example of how collaboration can lead to better conservation goals than uh, some of the approaches we've tried in the past. But please uh, ask your question. Uh, will you explain more the um, META, the meta uh, regression analysis? Sure. So some of you may have been familiar with the idea that meta-analysis is the study of studies, right? So think about, you know, uh, does red wine lower cholesterol, right? Lots of people hope, to, you know, it does, right? We look to the French and go, woohoo! But there's conflicting studies, right? And so what they do is collect up the studies and say, okay, what's the you know, effect over all these studies? So we assembled you know, like 40 or 50 endangered species willingness to pay studies. We have dollar values per household. We run that on some of the characteristics of the species. Was it a fish? Was it a marine mammal? Was it a bird? Uh, was it annual or one-time willingness to pay? And once we get to significant variables, now I can take that equation and I can make a prediction. Okay, well, what would people pay for a small increase in these endangered fish populations? So that equation allows us to kind of um, synthesize all of the endangered species valuation studies and apply them to make an estimate. So and if you're interested, this was published, as I say, my student's master's thesis. So we published this in Ecological Economics um, a couple years ago. Um, it's Richardson, actually. The other Richardson I've had is uh, she just graduated. So I've now graduated two Richardsons <laughs> over time and uh, myself. So as I say, it's a nice way to do benefit transfer. Not perfect, but it's a, you know, as I say, it kind of is a systematic way to use all the literature. By the way, if I answer the question, you need to tell me to stop, you know, throw a flag or something. I'll just keep talking if you don't. Please. I was just going to ask, uh, I'm a physician. I'm concerned about water pollution, and are, are we picking up levels of pesticides and PCBs in, in the upper Colorado River in the endangered species in the trout, and who's responsible for, you know, keeping the river clean, basically? Where does that fit into this? Oh, so, so the question is, I'm sorry, repeat that. I'm not sure I completely understood. How do we make sure the river's not being polluted? I mean, who's responsible oh, okay. for that in the stakeholder process? And are you analyzing the fish to see if they're picking up agricultural chemicals and various... I would think, so in other words, one of the elements of this, right, is the uh, research and monitoring program. So, I mean, that, that program, I imagine, particularly, I know in the Grand Canyon where I've worked as a science advisor there, you know, they're monitoring the population and they're, you know, they're, they are allowed by Fish and Wildlife Service to, you know, take fish <laughs> periodically and do electrofishing and things like that. So I would presume as part of their research and monitoring they are. And, you know, there's, you know, the Clean Water Act, right, and, and it's been one element. Now the biggest challenge in somewhat there, particularly with agricultural pesticides, 
is the fact that non-point source pollution regulation, right, is not, uh, um, you know, sort of a legal requirement under the Clean Water Act. Now, I know Colorado's, with regard to fertilizer, though, Colorado's embarking on, um, as part of the non-point source pollution control, and that was a big issue over there, um, and, and they're just starting to look at that. On the front range, it's water, wastewater treatment and farms, but on the west slope, it's primarily a lot of that irrigated agriculture. And I don't know if salt, that's another big one, that uh, salinity. And I haven't seen any discussion of that on, you know, effects of that on the fish. I mean, I, because it's higher than, you know, you would suspect than baseline levels. So. Thanks, John. A fascinating story. I, I want to ask you to, um, to kind of project forward. Yeah, so this, this looks like it was very successful. And that's your conclusion, that's what says there. So what are the lessons if we're going to try and replicate this in other settings? And is, is it, and specifically, I know that you focused on a lot on the economics. Is it, was this cost shifting? <laughs> uh, setting aside the equity or what was it? Was there something also in the way the collaboration was conducted, the process that really made it successful? Because a lot of collaborations fail. Right. And so what was it about this, and how would we replicate this and push it into other arenas? Now that's a, yeah, that's a good, a good question, and, and that's actually, I mean, it's a little, this is one of the problems with doing case studies, as you know, right? So the folks in the business college and, and elsewhere often rely on this sort of case study approach, and most economists go, no, 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 give me a random sample of, you know, <laughs> several hundred of these things so I can draw conclusions. And so, yeah, I mean, that's... I'm not a you know, fan of sort of the case study approach because, yeah, it is hard, and given the amount of time we spent with these people, um, I think the event that triggered a lot of this stuff was one, you know, and I think this is a, a lesson that anybody that doesn't have their head buried in the sand, right? You look at what happens in most other endangered species conflicts, and the judge ends up <laughs> running it. So they've got a collaborative approach down in the lower Colorado River in the Grand Canyon stretch there. And again, it's been keep everybody together and don't sue. <laughs> the Secretary of Interior saying, look, what can we do? What kind of resources? So, you know, in some sense, you've got to have support at the top that says, yeah, we don't want you people to fight. We'll support you. We'll provide resources. And so I think that was one element here was there was support at the top to say, okay, look, let's, yeah. <laughs> we don't want another one in court. The other thing was, is when um, Fish and Wildlife Service issued a, 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 a draft opinion that would have required this replacement, one for one replacement, you divert an acre foot, you have to replace an acre foot. That got the irrigators and diverters really <laughs> got their attention goes, okay, this is ridiculous. And, you know, it was sort of, what do we do? Um, but one of the people that was kind of the lead on this for the irrigators was, okay, we're going to go to court and fight this under the state water rights. But, you know, I think there was a great quote I saw um, when Reagan was trying to push for, you know, this, uh, you know, state versus federal supremacy. That says, you know, the issue of federal versus state supremacy was settled at Appomattox. <laughs> <laughs> Chances are you're not going to win. I mean, they knew that while they had state water rights, and they even had this Colorado River Compact, which is, you know, quasi-federal, that, boy, you know, up against the Endangered Species Act. Again, if you look around, <laughs> you know that, you know, you might win, but you're just going to spend a lot of resources. And the worst thing is, you're not going to get your permits to go ahead on your project. Everything's, you know, frozen. So I think it was the Fish and Wildlife Service making that move <laughs> that says, here's what we're going to require. And it's, okay, that's, you know, we, we can't have that. So now do we sue or do we sort of collaborate? And I'm not sure the personalities involved. Oftentimes that's a lot of it, is the people that say, okay, look, we're willing to sit down and talk. I met with a group of people this morning on the um, predator control, another very, uh, you know, contentious issue. 
So these folks are with USDA Wildlife Services representing livestock with the hunters, hunter groups and so forth. And I says, look, we're doing some of this stuff for Natural Resource Defense Council, Defenders of Wildlife. In fact, our meta-analysis is on our department website, was helped develop, uh, funded by the Defenders of Wildlife. Can't we just, you know, get everybody to sit down instead of being, your study sucks, your study sucks, <laughs> your numbers, our numbers, right? Can we develop one set of numbers? And so we've had some success through analysis of bridge building. And so that's another avenue in some cases where rather than having competing numbers, uh, we did this with Trout Unlimited, the Henry's Fork Foundation, and the Bureau of Reclamation. Okay, you know, the Henry's Fork Foundation on the Henry's Fork River and the Trout Unlimited are going, the Bureau of Reclamation's undervaluing our fishing. They think the only value of water is growing potatoes in Idaho. <laughs> and the Bureau's going, well, give us better numbers. <laughs> And numbers that are supportable, don't just, you know, make these things up. And so we were able to pull people, you know. So I think one message to all of you out there is to think about you as an analyst maybe being that neutral third party and bringing people together. Because what I always tell people, I don't do advocacy research, and you shouldn't do advocacy research. You should do good scientific research, and what your proof of that is, that you can publish it in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. And so that's the standard you should shoot for. And in many cases, that's the standard both groups are interested in. And so that's been another, you know, sort of avenue. I mean, a little bit of a tangent, but. Other questions, comments? Yeah. I had a similar thought to uh, Dr. Irvin on the collaboration process and then also uh, looking forward. Uh, in the collaboration process that may have been out of your scope, do you know, um, like the, you obviously had a, a process improvement achievement that you guys got to. Do you know the methodology that, methodology that was used to get to that improvement? Um, and then how do you maintain that improvement? Right. So as I say, I think the triggering event was Fish and Wildlife Service's, you know, insistence. And I think at that point, if you look at that list, let's see if we can just go back here. See if I can get this thing to go back far enough with the list of stakeholders. Some of these people have a working relationship that you can build on. Let's see how we get back here. So if you look at this list, I mean, you know, one is just to look for people that have existing working relationships. So in many cases, right, that the, these state agencies work with the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, in many cases, um, you know, some of these groups, right, work with the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, Bureau of Reclamation and Fish and Wildlife Service and the Park Service are all in Department of Interior. And in many cases have the same assistant secretary. So, you know, there's opportunities, I think, for, you know, in what happened in this case, particularly to get the funding, was that, you know, the these folks here, now that federal agencies can't lobby Congress for money, <laughs> but you know these folks that work with the Bureau of Reclamation and Fish and Wildlife say, okay, well, what is it gonna take? Well, let's have a multi-pronged recovery program. Where are we gonna get the money? Okay, well, look, if the senators and representatives here can get them on board, right? And so the idea is this Colorado Water Congress, one of the bigger water users, uh, and some of these other water groups, you know, said, okay, look, let's get together with our state representatives. Let's try and get some money for the Bureau of Reclamation. We trust the Bureau of Rec the water users, right, trust the Bureau of Reclamation. Why do you think, uh, what is it, 70-some percent of the funding is going to the Bureau of Reclamation, right? Not to the Fish and Wildlife Service. <laughs> so I think you can look for some, ex build on existing working relationships, build on, because that trust takes years to develop in many cases. And so if you've got a working relationship like these agents, the, these groups have, and, and the state has with the Bureau of Reclamation, then okay, look, we've already got some prior working relationship. And the Bureau of Reclamation people, right, you know, often work with the Fish and Wildlife Service folks. They're sister federal agencies, you know, they do Section 7 consultations on their own projects and stuff like that. So it's kind of like a snowballing thing, you know, a network, I guess, is the, uh, 
in vogue word, right, ever since the uh, you know, social network and so forth is, okay, there's already some network there of, of trust relationships. Can you expand that and you can get over then, okay, now how are we gonna get, you know, the nature conservancy, right, and the groups I met with this morning on predator control, okay, look, I've been trying to get Defenders of Wildlife and Natural Resource Defense Council. Do you guys, you know, in the hunting groups and USDA Wildlife Services, what do you do with those people? We see them in court. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to get them to come to the table to help design this study. Would you welcome them to the table and at least let them sit at the table and, and talk about this stuff? So that's, a, you know, again, the idea is if you've got some working relationships that you can build on. Other questions? So, thank you. I was curious, uh, would it be possible for Department of Interior and many of these services to work together collaboratively uh, for environmental cleanup efforts, like Superfund sites, et cetera? Would it be helpful, this process be helpful work getting those organizations to work together as well? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for, you know, certainly these agencies, I mean, you'd have to, one of the things, and <clears throat> there's people here like Craig Shin that know more about these things than I do, but, you know, there has to be a federal connection to these things. So some of these agencies, you know, might not. Now, there was a successful cleanup of a Superfund site um, in Colorado that was a Department of Energy uh, weapons, the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And... Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, worked with them. And again, the congressional delegation, it is now a national wildlife refuge. Because in many cases, and, and we've worked on some of this with military bases, the core of these things, right, is polluted as hell. But they had a huge buffer, a no man's land, right, that nobody was allowed into. Well, that's pretty good habitat, it turns out, because there weren't houses in there, off-highway vehicles, you know, all sorts of things. And so you, you got to clean up that core. But then, in fact, you know, you've got this huge area that's in actually pretty good shape. And so the Rocky Mountain Arsenal was a case, and I haven't studied it in enough detail to know, you know, how... You know, I, but I know Congress, you know, funded Department of Energy, you know, to and there were some court suits again with the uh, contractor that was, you know, putting the plutonium triggers together and all this stuff to clean it up. Um, but then, yeah, it was turned over to, you know, the idea is once the cleanup was turned over to Fish and Wildlife Service. So there you've got a nice, you know, example. And I think with military bases, um, in fact, the one in San Francisco, right, the Presidio, I think, was... Uh, so I think there are opportunities, but you got to get either a federal connection or, you know, having worked for federal agencies, when a senator <laughs> gets involved and starts talking to the Secretary of Interior and says, look, you know, my constituents want this to happen, you know, that gets the agency's attention and, you know, those sorts of things happen. And some of you have heard of pork barrel politics. Well, with national parks and stuff, they're called park barrel politics, right? I mean, they can get the Great Basin National Park in uh, um, off of I-80 in uh, Nevada, for example. So, yeah, I mean, you, you got to look for obvious connections. You know, the EPA has an obvious connection, but, you know, HUD, Housing and Urban Development, for example, uh, or a you know, again, an urban, you know, some urban agency if it's that area. I know I've seen this in natural resource damage assessment where, again, they do a cooperative, you know, sort of effort getting everybody together. You're probably seeing that in the Gulf oil spill with National Marine Fishery Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, Bureau of Land Management. So there's, you know, usually if you look, you know, and this is more political science, but, you know, look at the laws and say, well, wow, these people have a common charge. Get them together. John, if I may, following on the past couple of questions, um, I wanted to ask, you know, federal agencies have, a, I guess, a reputation for being both bureaucratic and sometimes heavy-handed. <laughs> and then on the flip side, we now have a greater awareness of the federal budget deficit, a lot more attention to cutting costs in government. Um, I wondered if you 
uh, you know, look into the future, what do you th think about the sort of federal agency appetite for experimental methods or more collaborative methods, um, given the fact that at least in this example, a lot of the costs of the recovery program are uh, borne by federal agencies? Right. Well, I mean, in our review of some of the saying worked in the Grand Canyon stuff, adaptive management, right? So you've almost got these two, and I haven't seen quite how these things relate, but you've got, you know, big push for adaptive management, whether it's in the Everglades, for example, the Grand Canyon, and this sort of collaborative. And it may be that, you know, these things sort of come together. So rather than writing sort of, right, the grandiose plans, which cost, you know, millions of dollars to write, and require hundreds of million dollars to implement. The experimentation is, okay, and this is how it's worked in the Grand Canyon. They have to get the stakeholders to buy into the experimentation, especially with endangered species. So, you know, you've got groups that say, you know, you're going to try, and if you remember some of the big uh, flood events, right, where they purposely released huge quantities of water from Glen Canyon Dam to simulate like a spring flood. Okay, you know, what, this might <laughs> cause some harm to these species down there in the short run. But we're going to learn something, we're going to simulate, we're going to monitor, and we're thinking the best available science says this is going to work. But you needed a collaborative process so that somebody didn't go, screw you, we're suing. You're not going to do that release <laughs> in the Grand Canyon. So I think that's where the two kind of went hand in hand. So there, that's the only place I've seen where, you know, and I, but I haven't studied the Everglades. That would be another one worth looking at where they've got an adaptive management program and I don't know enough about the, if it's a, a collaborative. But I think, you know, now that we've talked about it, it seemed to me that those two are really, uh, would leverage each other um, on that. Because, yeah, I mean, you, you've got to have, and the other thing is these people, you know, oops, you know, can provide, in some cases, provide resources. If you look at what Defenders of Wildlife did on the Wolf Recovery Program, where they were helping to compensate ranchers, they went to their con members, right, and says, we've got this compensation program. <laughs> well, you know, here's where the money's going. It's not going into lawsuits. It's going to actually compensate ranchers so they won't be so opposed to the wolf reintroduction and won't be out there, you know, what they say with endangered species. Uh, shoot, shovel, and shut up, right? <laughs> and so in this case, you know, they, they, they didn't uh, actively oppose it as much. So I think some of these groups can, can definitely provide resources or lower costs. Other questions or comments? Well, thank you all for being here, and please join me in uh, showing our thanks to Dr. John Loomis for speaking to us. We'll be back here next week, same time, with uh, Tim Kasser. So I hope that you'll uh, join us again. If the students could just check in over here in the corner, that would be great. Good evening. <laughs>